Over the last several lectures, we've been looking at how traits are transmitted from one generation of organisms to the next. We've seen how the movement of chromosomes during mitosis and meiosis are responsible for the continuity of genetic information across generations by assuring that when cells divide, their daughter cells obtain a complete set of genes. Two copies of each gene obtained on homologous chromosomes in the case of mitosis, one copy of each gene during meiosis when haploid gametes are formed. We've also seen how Mendel modeled the genetic basis of trait transmission from parents to offspring based on his experiments with pea plants, showing how traits can assort independently from one another, yielding novel recombinant phenotypes in subsequent generations. A theme of this discussion has been to emphasize how genetic variation arises in populations. Remember that some of this variation is caused by mutations, and even more genetic variation arises when organisms reproduce sexually as the result of genetic recombination. Now, an important consequence of the fact that genetic variation is introduced with each successive gen generation as organisms reproduce is that this variation provides the substrate for evolutionary change in populations. That is, the biological information, using the term we started this section of the course with, is transmitted from one generation to the next, but does not necessarily stay constant. And a manifestation of this fact has been the transformation and diversification of life on Earth over evolutionary time. Now, I introduced the idea of evolution by natural selection at the very beginning of this course, when we asked how life might have arisen on the early Earth. Over the next several lectures, what we're going to do is to look in more detail at biological evolution and the mechanisms by which it's thought to occur, beginning today with the work of Charles Darwin, the person who developed the theory of natural selection and in so doing profoundly transformed our scientific view of biology, if not our view of the world at large and probably more so than any other individual who's ever lived. Darwin lived and worked in the middle of the 19th century at about the same time as Gregor Mendel. Uh, it's interesting that even though Darwin and Mendel were contemporaries, um, the two men never met, and there's no evidence that they even knew about each other or about each other's work. Nowadays, biologists take for granted the fact that evolution occurs, but that wasn't really the case 150 years ago when Darwin first introduced his ideas. So as we did with Mendel, let's begin by looking at Darwin's life in order to understand his ideas and where they came from. Darwin was born in 1809 in Shrewsbury, England, in a socially uh, well-connected family. As a boy, the young Charles Darwin developed a keen passion for nature. He was the kind of kid who loved to walk in the woods, collect bugs, go hunting and fishing, bird watching, and generally spend time learning about different kinds of plants and animals. Now, Darwin's father was a well-known physician who really wanted his son to follow him in the medical profession. So in the 1820s, when Darwin was only 16 years old, he was packed off to uh, medical school at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Darwin at the time had no interest in medicine, however. In fact, it's said that he found it distasteful and even a little upsetting. So he wasn't a successful student, and he soon left the university without a degree. But it wouldn't do for a young man of Darwin's social status uh, in 19th century England to not study for some career, so Darwin enrolled instead in Christ College at Cambridge University to study theology with the goal of entering the clergy. Darwin wanted to be a country vicar. Now, the fact that Darwin went on to complete a bachelor's degree in theology with the idea of becoming a vicar may sound a little surprising to us, but it isn't really. The study of natural history in the 1800s, especially in the first part of that century, was largely done in the context of what we call natural theology, describing nature in order to more fully appreciate the glory of God. Thus, some of the most important natural historians of the time were clergymen. And don't forget that Mendel himself was a monk. And so it seemed to Darwin to be a good way to pursue his true passions. Unlike his experiences with medicine in Edinburgh, Darwin excelled in his studies at Cambridge and became a protege of many of the most eminent professors there. It was this connection that led Darwin to be offered a unique opportunity to 
when he graduated in 1831. Instead of going on to become a country vicar, Darwin was asked to serve as the official naturalist on a five-year-long voyage around the world on the British Navy's ship HMS Beagle. Darwin's job was twofold. First, he was to provide interesting intellectual conversation to the ship's captain for five years. And second, and more importantly, he was to acquire and catalog plant and animal specimens from every place the ship visited on its circumnavigation of the globe. This was something the British Navy was doing a lot in the middle part of the uh, eight, uh, 1800s. Now, when Darwin started his voyage around the world, a long-held view in science and one that Darwin himself almost certainly subscribed to was that all organisms were formed by a special creation, much as is described in the book of Genesis in the Bible. And, importantly, that species had remained immutable, unchanged throughout all time. Now, this view of the world isn't just a Christian idea. Some Greek philosophers talked about evolution in their writings, but in fact, Plato and his most famous student, Aristotle, argued that species must be immutable. In particular, Plato's ideas about the existence of an, of an ideal external world, of which our material world is only a reflection, was simply not compatible with the idea that things in the material world could ever change. Thus, the idea that species living today were completely unchanged throughout time had been a dominant view in Western culture for several thousand years. However, early in the 1800s, there were a few scientific findings beginning to emerge that began to suggest this view was not entirely correct. In fact, there were three general kinds of evidence that were particularly challenging to the idea of an immutable creation. The first sort of evidence came from the field of geology. Creationist views of the world argued that the Earth was relatively young is suggested by a literal interpretation of the Old Testament. For example, in one uh, famous estimate, um, Archbishop James Usher of the Irish Protestant Church argued that the earth was created in 4004 BC at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. But geologists who were studying landforms and rock formations saw evidence that convinced them that the earth had to be a lot older than this. First, their analyses showed that the Earth might be unfathomably older, maybe millions of years older, much older than anybody had conceived of at the time. Second, geologists saw that landscape features had obviously undergone many radical transformations. One only has to drive along an interstate highway and look at road cuts to see the bending and the folding in the rocks, which is exactly the kind of thing that these geologists were seeing. Third, geologists began to realize, and this is an important point, that physical forces at work in nature today could explain the transformations in landforms that must have occurred in the distant past. For example, they saw how erosion from rivers and rainfall, if given enough time, could lead to landscape level transformations such as the creation of a canyon. These ideas were developed completely by the leading geologist, geologist of Darwin's day, Charles Lyell who in the 1820s formally developed the idea of geological gradualism. The theory of gradualism argued that large-scale changes in the geological features of the Earth could be explained by the gradual accumulation of many small changes over a very long period of time. And this was eventually very important to Darwin's thinking. Now, the word, word evolution simply means change. And what geology has done, had done was show that the physical world, at least, could have changed over a long period of time. Now, the second kind of evidence that began challenging the immutability of biological species in particular came from the work of comparative anatomists. At the time, biology was largely a descriptive enterprise involving the collection, the dissection, and the detailed description of different kinds of plants and animals. 